Let's talk about somebody going to, say, a grocery store, a health food store, going to the refrigerated section, getting a classic probiotic capsule or powder, and talk about what happens when we ingest that, and then we'll move into the spore-based. Yeah, and, and here's an important thing for people to understand. Why is it in the refrigerator to begin with? right? Uh, how did they figure out they want to put this product in the refrigerator? Well, as it turned out, when people started, uh, you know, producing and releasing probiotics, this, this was really starting to pick up steam in the late 80s and early 90s, and then really grew in the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, the, the, the term probiotic was really coined in the 1960s, but, but probiotics weren't really a component of the health food industry until that late 90s, early 2000s period. Now, here's what happened. People started taking fermenting organisms, right? So take Lactobacillus acidophilus, for example. It's the most common pro uh, probiotic strain out there. Why is it? Is it because it's some? it has some special function inside the body? No, it's because it was the most common fermentation strain, right? Acidophilus, as it suggests, is a microbe that likes that that functions better at lower pH. It likes acid more than other bacteria, and so you can ferment it at a lower pH. You can ferment dairy, for example, at a lower pH with acidophilus. That actually produces a, a better tasting dairy ferment, less sour in in general, right? So acidophilus became synonymous with fermentation. And then fermentation was mistakenly think, thought of as a probiotic source. So then somebody said, well, I'm just going to take the acidophilus that I, we use in fermentation, put it in a capsule, and make that a probiotic, right? And so that's how some of the initial probiotics got started. They were fermentive bacteria that are used to make fermentive, uh, fermented foods that now were, were isolated and put into capsules. The problem is these microbes don't function in the intestines. They function outside of the intestines in a fermentation factory. And so taking them on their own doesn't really have any benefit. But then of course, in our megalomaniacal society, people said, well, if, you know, a billion of this fermented bacteria is good, maybe two billions better, maybe 10 billions better. Then all these companies started competing with each other on this billions of CFUs idea, right? They started creating this false notion that the potency and efficacy of a probiotic is dependent on its CFU count when it actually is not, right? So now we started getting 50 billion, 80 billion, 100 billion CFU products. They were just competing with each other more and with higher and higher doses. However, what started to happen is most of these organisms are very unstable. They're not designed to be on a shelf. They're not designed to go through the gastric system. And so when they started fermenting or producing, the formulating these products, putting, putting say 50 billion in a capsule and putting it on the shelf, the, those microbes started having high attrition rates, meaning they're dying in the capsule because they're such unstable organisms for that type of system. And so then class action lawyers started saying, hey, this company is saying this 50 billion column colony forming units. That's what CFU is, right? CFU is basically you take the bacteria, you plate it, every single cell will form a single colony. So if you have 50 billion colony forming units, you should be able to plate it and count that on a plate. And so, so what the lawyers are doing is grabbing these products off the shelf and testing them to see if they actually contain 50 billion CFUs. Well, most of those products would face massive amounts of attrition, so they might now have 10 billion CFUs, 5 billion CFUs, and then they, these companies are getting sued for false advertising, right? So then the company said, oh, okay, well, what should we do in order to preserve these microbes so they don't die? Well, one of the ways in which you preserve microbes and stop them from growing and dying is by refrigerating them. Right, So that's where the idea of refrigerating these probiotics came from. So they did two things. They said, we're going to put overage. If we say 50 billion per capsule, we're actually going to put in 200 billion so that we have some slack there. And then we're going to refrigerate it so that the microbes are suspended and stuck metabolically and they won't die. So microbes, when you refrigerate them, don't multiply and they don't die either. Right, They can stay in the suspended animation. And so that was a whole reason for this refrigerated probiotic nonsense, right? It has nothing to do with efficacy. It has nothing to do with science. It has nothing to do with research. And, and then come all this, this high dose was all marketing as well. 
the vast majority of probiotic studies are normally done with a single strain at three to five billion CFUs, and they're not refrigerated, right? So, so that was just a, a, a very misleading uh, approach to how you think about probiotics, right? It's not the number of species. That doesn't matter. I would rather have one viable functional species in the probiotic than, a, than 15 nonsense species in there that the company has no idea how they work together, whether they knock out each other's function, they compete, or they're all just dying. And I would rather have the clinically efficacious dose of 3 billion, 4 billion, or whatever the studies have shown versus just having something with hundreds or 50 billion in there, right? So if you go and, you, and you're told that the refrigerated probiotics are the best and the highest quality, you take those home, as soon as you pull them out of the refrigerator, they'll start to die. While you're driving in your car to your house, they're dying. While you put them in your cabinet, they're dying. And every single day that they're sitting in your cabinet, they're dying. And then the moment you take them and you ingest them, any of them that are still alive in the capsule will be obliterated in the stomach acid. And so you're getting a bunch of bacterial debris, not really a probiotic, because the, there's a scientifically accepted definition of the probiotic that was put forth by the WHO that's widely accepted by all researchers in this field. And that is a live microorganism when administered in adequate amounts confers a health benefit to the host. So that first part is really important. It has to be a live microorganism. So it sounds like it would be a lot like the fermented food where there would be certain benefits from the bacteria, but we can't expect it to get to the colon alive. That's right. Now, in, in the case of what I call kitchen sink probiotics, there are a couple of dangers with them as well, right? So, so normally in fermentation, you don't have 15 different strains represented in the product, right? Because fermentation is normally done by one species. And so if you have a fermented dairy, you've got one species that's doing that. So when you consume it, you're consuming the one species and all the debris of the one species. Um, the thing with these kitchen sink formulas with 15, 16 different species in there. The problem that exists is many of these species can be inflammatory. And in fact, we've checked this. Uh, when One of my last projects when, when, when I was at Microbiome Labs, we were working with University College Cork and researchers at the APC. And what they were showing is many of the common, commonly used strains as probiotics actually increase inflammation they trigger a whole cascade of inflammatory responses, right? So when the debris is coming in at that high dose, it can actually make you more inflamed. In fact, when you talk to clinicians, many clinicians didn't use any probiotics with patients that have really inflammatory conditions, right? Think about patients with mast cell activation syndrome or histamine intolerance or SIBO even, right? Clinicians weren't using probiotics with them. Why? Because in most cases, these probiotics made them feel worse because these probiotics are actually activating a whole series of inflammatory responses in the body. Now, we also know from studies uh, from the, um, uh, I think the, the university, there's an there's a international university in uh, Israel that showed that these kitchen sink type formulas can actually compete for binding sites with your own natural versions of those species. So taking them, for example, after the course of antibiotics will actually slow down the recovery of your microbiome after the course of antibiotics, right? So in my, in my view, there's almost no need for a hodgepodge kitchen sink probiotic with 15, 18 different species in it because there's no good scientific rationale behind them, right? Four or five species, great, especially if you demonstrate in clinical trials on the finished formula that these four or five species work well together and they have a additive effect in the system, right? Many other uh, good probiotics will be a single species in them. Think about Saccharomyces boulardii, right? Floristor has been around forever. It's got uh, something like 75, 80 published studies on it, and it's a single organism. It's a, it's a, it's a yeast probiotic, but it's still a single organism. Right. Um, think about the uh, you know uh, the most common from Procter and Gamble, uh, which is Bifidolongum three five six two four, which is one of the most well studied organisms for IBS. Right, uh, and and Longum is a keystone species. 
that has almost 80 published studies on this one strain. That's the number one selling probiotic uh, in the US market um, because, and it's a single strain, right? At three or 4 billion CFUs because it matches all of the clinically relevant data. So this whole idea of just throwing stuff together and saying, hey, we have 15 strains and 50 billion CFUs, it's all marketing nonsense. So when it comes to Longum or Floristar, it sounds like you're a fan of those. Are those refrigerated ones? They're not. Are they just, okay. I just want to understand the nuance there. Is there anything in the fridge you would take? No, I don't see any benefit to any of them that need to be refrigerated, right? To me, if they need to be refrigerated, the assumption is the viable cell is important for functionality. But that cell is not going to be viable the moment it hits my stomach anyway. Right, the longum is an interesting one, right? So um, the you know P and G, the company that that has uh, the the longum product out there, and, and we were working with, we own that longum strain, actually uh, that three five six two four strain. That, what when I say we, I mean Microbiome Labs and Novozymes, um, not me personally, but um, that strain is an, it, very very interesting because. We took care to try to preserve it and manufacture the product under low moisture environment, low shear, and so on, so that we would preserve more of the organism, right? So that you're sending in viable strains into the system. However, when you heat kill that organism, you find that it has very similar efficacy, even though it's dead. And certain organisms do that. Now, the reason is because that particular organism, the thing that provides it its function is a very unique carbohydrate that the organism produces that's on the outer cell wall of the other uh, outer cell membrane of the bacteria, right? So the, the, the bacteria produces something called peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan is a very specialized carbohydrate structure that's embedded in the cell wall of the bacteria. And they have these, uh, what we call, we call them uh, polysaccharides, they're just meaning many different carbohydrates uh, that, that are sitting on the outer surface of the microbe. Now, those polysaccharides and peptidoglycans were what conferred all of the health benefits of that organism. We know that because we did studies where we took uh, the organism and we knocked out the gene that makes those polysaccharides, and then we tried them in animal and human studies, and they had no effect, right? And then we isolated the polysaccharide and tested that, and that had all the effects. Right, so that kind of organism, it doesn't matter actually if it's alive because the polysaccharide is on the outside of the organism. If it goes in and the stomach acid obliterates the organism, it releases the polysaccharide actually, right? And the way the organism actually functions is actually really interesting. So imagine it's a viable version of the organism. The cell is intact, the polysaccharide's all on the outside. It makes its way down the, the small intestine. It gets to the, to the end of the small bowel in an area called the pears patches. In that area, you have dendritic cells, which are some of your immune cells that, that reach across the lining of the gut and grab things, right? And sample things that are there. When it recognizes the presence of this organism, it actually grabs that organism, pulls it across the lining of the, gr uh, the gut, and brings it into circulation, right? Now, Normally, a dendritic cell is what we call an antigen-presenting cell because what it does is it eats things that are potentially harmful, digests the things on the inside, and then presents some component of that cell to your T cells and B cells so they can mount a response. So that's how dendritic cells function. But when the dendritic cell consume this micro, consumes this micro, it doesn't present anything to the T cells and B cells. It doesn't activate the immune system. Instead, what it does is it digests the microbe and spits out all those carbohydrates into circulation. That's how the carbohydrates end up in the neurological system and reduce inflammation and all that, right? So you need this interesting nuance and elegance of certain strains that allow them to work under many different conditions. You can't just throw together a bunch of random species and assume it's a probiotic. If you enjoyed that clip, you're going to want to head over here and catch a full episode. I'll see you over there. Adding spores to a gut microbiome in three weeks increased the diversity of the gut microbiome by almost 25 to 30%. And it increased the growth of keystone species and it brought down pathogens. So the spores are like the police or the orchestrator.